user acquisition is it's a drug that we're all hooked on and we're all very reliant on significant user acquisition because i mean frankly you know the dirty secret in gaming is you know there's significant churn right so you know you, you have to keep feeding the beast what does it take to win in user acquisition in 2023 hello and welcome to growth masterminds my name is john katsir Today, we're chatting with one of those guests whose LinkedIn profile is like 50 screens long. I'm almost <laughs> under joking. He's led an AI marketing company, Persado. He's been an analyst and partner at McKinsey. He founded a digital marketing agency in 2005, which is super early. Actually, exactly actually in 1998. Get out of here. Yes. Okay, LinkedIn yes. is wrong. <laughs> no, no, no. That's when it was acquired. It was acquired in 2005. But yes, 19, 1998. In fact, 19, you'll, you'll, you'll love this not to disrupt your intro, but I have- Totally an disrupted the intro. I know, I totally okay. did. I have an article that talks about how our digital marketing firm disrupted online advertising by creating the skyscraper. We went from horizontal to vertical, and that was news in 1998. Just, I had to throw that out there to date myself. Wow. You went from, you, you controlled the horizontal and you controlled the vertical. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little reference for early sci-fi for those who might catch that. <laughs> awesome. So that is very cool. That's predates the dot-com crash, which is insane. Uh, he's currently also an executive in residence at Adobe, which is interesting. I don't even know what that means. He's had lead roles in VC companies and is currently, and most importantly for today, chief growth officer of Mistplay, which got a lot of mentions in our recent singular ROI index, including a top five finish in global retention. His name is Jason Heller. Welcome, Jason. Thanks so much. I'm so happy to be here. Hey, awesome to have you. Congrats on making it into the singular ROI index in so many different places. Thanks, John. Give us the intro to Mistplay, uh, the 30, 45 second intro to Mistplay. Who is this company for people who don't know about it? Sure. So Misplay is the leading loyalty platform for mobile gaming. Uh, millions of users come to the platform uh, to discover new games. Uh, we do not incentivize downloads. What we do is we give uh, gamers uh, points for the time and money that they spend in games, and then they can redeem those points for gift cards. Uh, and we become a user acquisition source for you know hundreds of the top grossing IAP games in the space. So we, we have a bunch of IAA games as well, but, you know, by, by and large, you know, we, we are helping to drive in-app spending and, and create the retention and loyalty of those types of users. Super interesting and a different way of looking at the space, user acquisition space, retention space, all of that than many others. It's funny because I've been talking to a lot of Web3 people lately, including some real experts in Web3 gaming, and they're saying things like, hey, you spend three years in this game and you spend $500 or $3,000 in this game. And when you're kind of done, what do you have left? Nothing. Yeah. Well, you're kind of answering that in a different way. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting you mentioned Web3 because, you know, so, some people refer to what we do as play to earn, um, which, you know, I've honestly, I've stopped using that phrase as much as I would like, just because the Web3 companies have kind of hijacked it a little bit. And, you know, it's it's a really different kind of beast, right? The there's a, there is there is a movement of play to earn in Web3, but, it, but it's a speculative crypto NFT kind of market. It's not what we do, which is help. Uh, game publishers reach users who actually want to play their games, spend time and money in those games and, and, and earn based on the time and money they spend in games. So it's, it's a totally different beast. Um, but, you know, but that is what we do. We, we are a play to earn platform and that's the value prop to the user. Mm -hmm. Talk about user acquisition in 2023. Um, we know the challenges. Uh, SK Ad Network, ATT has been with us for 18 yep. months, two years. It's changing massively with Scan4 as we speak. About 1% mm -hmm. of postbacks are now Scan4 compatible postbacks, but it's not operational on a large scale by any means. Privacy Sandbox is, you know, that light at the end of the tunnel, or maybe it's the darkness at the end of the tunnel. Who knows? Talk mm -hmm. about 2023. 23 and user acquisition, what you see being successful and working. Yeah. By the way, I just hope that privacy sandbox isn't the uh, headlight of a train at the end of a tunnel. <laughs> yeah, <it could>. um, <laughs> uh, you know, you, user acquisition is it's uh, 
you know, it's, uh, if you will, a drug that we're all hooked on. <laughs> we're all very reliant on significant user acquisition because, I mean, frankly, you know, the dirty secret in gaming is, you know, there's significant churn, right? So, you know, you, you have to keep feeding the beast and um, it's as true in iOS as it is in an Android. Um, you know, I think, you know, the the issues on the iOS side are, are, are very clear and I think companies are navigating and, you know, adjusting accordingly. And, you know, the, the unfortunate part is that, you know, at least the last six months or so, you're starting to see, you know, all of the downstream implications of, you know, new regulations uh, coincide with, you know, a, a slight reduction in, in app purchasing behavior from users. And so that doesn't make it any easier. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we uh, you know, we're both a really, really large user acquisition client. You know, we, we buy ads, you know, on uh, all the, the, you know, usual, usual suspects that you would imagine. And we're also a UA source for the industry. And so we get to see it from both sides. And, you know, the interesting thing, you know, being a uh, UA source with a ton of uh, first party data, because we're not a network or a community, um, you know, we, we kind of get a little bit of luxury that that not everybody enjoys. You know, we, we can follow a user along their journey. We can re-engage somebody when they stop playing a game on behalf for a, of a client. Um, so, you know, you, you, uh, you know, you ask about like, where does user acquisition go in 2023? Um, you know, I think the, uh, you know, the, the short answer uh, is there's a little pressure on the demand for ROAS and, you know, we're, you know, and which, you know, it, it, has always existed, but I think this year you're going to see it a lot more, ma mainly because the IAP trends are down and, and it's, um, you know, it's not distributed evenly across the industry, right? So, you know, there's some games that just have immense amount of product market fit and, you know, they're not as affected, but I think the average game um, is feeling the pressure and they're seeing, you know, at times that CPIs are, are going up and TROAS is, or uh, ROAS is, is going down. Um, uh, it, 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 while it's different in both platforms, uh, you know, the prospect of privacy sandbox and what that means, which none of us know yet, by the way, right? At, the, at this point, you know, whenever, you know, you guys are watching this podcast, I mean, we're still at the developer preview stage and we, we still, you know, only have a date of probably 2024, which hopefully means probably 2025 at this point. Um, you know, again, it's, it's, uh, it's anybody's guess where that, where that heads. Um, what we're doing is, is we will be hedging for some of that. So because we are a community um, and we do have first party data, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to spill the beans on exactly what our strategy and plan is, and it'll probably change in the coming months as we learn more about it. But, uh, you know, our, our goal is to protect the data signals and visibility into attribution to every extent that we can. And, uh, you know, there's a few different ways that we could do that, that again, because we're not an ad network, you know, we're, we're kind of at an advantage in, the, in that capacity. It's a couple different advantages that you have really, because you said, you know, basically you buy uh, from yep. typical user acquisition channels and off obviously you offer. So you see both sides of that. Yep. That's a significant advantage. There, there's things, lessons to be learned there, but also because you have first party data, mm -hmm. gamers are on your platform. They're part of your community. That's huge. We've yep. seen platform effects, right? When you can, I don't want to say own a community because I don't believe in owning a community, but when you can harness a community, if you want mm -hmm. to say something like that, and you have that first party data and you can offer things to that community within that community, mm -hmm. that's all within the walls. And there's a lot you can do with that. It, it, exactly. Now, look, there's no, there's no ironclad protection against, you know, the self-regulatory pain that, that Apple and, and potentially Google can inflict on everybody. Um, you know, I've, I've been in this industry for a really long time, or I should say I've been in the digital marketing industry, digital advertising industry for a really long time, uh, not so not so long on the gaming side. So I, I've seen this movie play out on the non-mobile side. I've seen it drag out. I've seen it, you know, obfuscate, you know, data signals. I've seen the pain that it caused. And I, I've seen companies come out of the other side stronger and more resilient. And, I, and I've seen plenty of companies go under because, you know, they never had a strong proposition to begin with. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, 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 the silver liner is that the silver lining is that's kind of healthy. Um, the unfortunate 
side is there's a bunch of collateral damage that comes out of that. And there's a bunch of like really well-intentioned companies that, you know, will, will not be able to operate with the level of precision and rigor that they would have preferred uh, in the name of protecting consumers' privacy from the small number of bad actors that are out there. And so it's unfortunate. Um, it's just, you know, comes with the territory, but it, it's unfortunate. And, and look, we'll, we will all be stronger because of, you know, where, wherever we land on this. The industry is not going to regulate itself out of existence. 100% believe that. 100% believe that the industry will be stronger as well. And 100% believe that even though we had something that we thought was definitive in IDFA and we have something we think is definitive in GAID, mm -hmm. uh, it's not as simple as it looks. It's no. not as simple as we've been treating it. Uh, human behavior and motivation isn't as simple as last click. There's a lot more going on and we're going to learn a lot more about how to actually measure impact of our marketing as we go forward. Absolutely. 23 and 20. 2024. Talk about your placement on the ROI index. Um, you don't have to get into details there, but why did Misplay do very, very well? What have you done really well in the last 18 months? Sure. Well, first of all, we're, we're super excited for you know the, those accolades and, and uh, very honored to be on that list. Uh, you know, one one thing most people don't realize. I mean, I honestly, if I took a poll of like you know a hundred of your listeners, I don't know. 80 of them probably never heard of misplay right but we're you know we're we're you know we're we're an up and comer we we've, we've become a um you know a stable place on the media mix of of most of the large uh you know top grossing games in the industry um we were uh we had a, a majority of the company was acquired by a private equity firm in December of 21 um we've been growing 100% a year i mean i'm not going to share some of our numbers but i mean we you know we we in 2023 will be you you know the size of, of you know most most of the mid like let's say let's call it upper upper tier the middle bottom tier the top in terms of like you know <laughs> revenue um, for whatever that means uh, but you get you get my picture um, yes. you know we we've invested in people and technology you know we hired uh, an entire leadership team you know besides myself you know we've got a, a new chief product officer, chief data and I officer, chief people officer, CFO, general counsel. Like we, we've we become a grown up company, right? We went from scrappy startup to grown up company in a matter of a year. Um, you know, we have uh, put the stake in the ground that we're going to make data and AI a competitive advantage of the business. Uh, we are building some amazing uh, predictive capabilities uh, that is driving um, a real win, 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 meaning you know, our users get more relevant games because we could predict what they actually want. Uh, our clients get higher ROAS because we have an uncanny ability uh, to predict the uh, day seven and longer term ROAS of, or actually not ROAS, uh, longer term uh, spending, in-app spending of an individual against any particular game in our platform. And then obviously when our clients are happy, they spend more money with us and we win, right? And so, you know, so it's it, it's a really unique, great situation to be in when, you know, through a very practical yet sophisticated application of AI, you know, we, we can create that win-win-win amongst our users, our clients, and, you know, our business. Um, and now we have, you know, investors in a, a you know, multi-year strategy of, you know, how to be a, a billion-dollar-plus company, um, you know, which which is, is crazy considering where we were just, you know, a year and a half ago. So it's been a wild ride and, and you know, we're in no, 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 uh, no signs of slowing down. Uh, you know, the, the last thing I'd mention there, because you asked about the accolades, some of those accolades, which we're very proud of, by the way, is is uh, focused on retention. Mm -hmm. And because we're a loyalty platform, because we actually can engage a user through their life cycle, we know the games they're playing, we know how long they're playing them, we know when they stop playing them, and so we have the ability to drive you know outsized retention. And and it's the tip of the iceberg. We're we're actually going to be releasing some. Uh, products within the next, let's call it six to 12 months to be fair, uh, that's focused on helping clients truly proactively engage users along that life cycle where today we kind of do that in the background. We're, we're actually going to be doing that in the foreground in, in a uh, sort of a product uh, productized manner. Oh, interesting. Sounds like a mini braze or uh, or clever tap or something like that. I won't ask you to reveal things that you're not going to reveal. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, the short the short version of it is, you know, we we are developing 
well, we have a developed live ops capability for ourselves, the same way most of the large nice. game companies have live ops. And so, you know, we, we can leverage that live ops capability and the economy design behind it to engage users throughout their life cycle and how we choose to use that live ops capability in terms of balancing our clients' interests and our interests is, is something that's kind of unique to us. And, and you know, there'll be some bunch of products that emerge from that scenario. It's really, really interesting because if I if I look at what you do and how you operate, I've always felt like Unity has a massive untapped advantage because half the mobile games are built with them. <laughs> yeah. But they're not seeming to be able to always connect what's going on there and who's in there because they don't have that first party relationship. I was just going to say that they're, 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 they are a platform provider. They, they're, you know, and, and an amazing one, obviously, but they are not the community. Yeah. And if they could ever do that, um, huge, huge, huge value to unlock on that side, but very, very hard to do <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because your customers uh, in their case are the actual developers who want their own community. So that is super interesting yeah. and neat to hear about the rapid, rapid growth. We've talked about some of the changes, obviously, ATT and Privacy Sandbox. You've got some unique advantages. I guess we've already touched on them, but you've got some unique advantages because you know players. How long do players stay in your system? How long do players stay in your community? Is it like do they ever drop off? I mean, and how, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, you know, there's no there's no one answer to that, but I would say you know, many game publishers would be really jealous if they looked at how many of our players stay around generating revenue after a year. Um, you know, in, in all game environments, and for me coming, you know, I came to the company outside of gaming, right? I mean, I've been in sort of, uh, you know, performance driven digital marketing for 20 plus years, but uh, never really had the immersion into gaming as I've had the last year. To look at the level of churn that the gaming industry looks at as acceptable for an e-commerce company or a travel company or a fintech or a financial service, like like the amount of churn is is like mind blowing to somebody who's never actually been immersed in the mobile gaming industry. But it's normal mm -hmm. in the mobile gaming industry, right? And so, um, you know, we we have, and I'm not going, you know, I don't want to share numbers here, but like we we have a best in class retention curve, right? So even if you look at day 30, we can benchmark ourselves against, you know, the, the top of the pack. Um, now, the interesting thing, and, and we've got these like massive aspirations, like if you look at the games that really are driving like what I would call retained revenue, right? So how much revenue is retained without having to go out and spend tens of millions of dollars on user acquisition companies like Roblox, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you look at the day 30 retention trend of a Roblox versus let's just use a coin master or, you know, another great, amazing, you know, high grossing IAP game. Um, the difference is not day 30. The difference is day 180, day 360, and probably multi-year, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, cohort uh, life cycle. Um, it's amazing how they retain users over the long term. Now, look, not everybody can compare themselves to Roblox. And like, when I look at, you know, what do we want misplay to be three years from now, you know, we and our board of directors, like we, we talk about Roblox and Netflix and other like really large, sticky consumer products, consumer communities. That's the bar that we're holding ourselves to. Um, and you know what they say, you know, if you shoot to the moon, you know, You'll get somewhere along that journey. And so, you know, that's our goal. Our goal is to create a, a, a community of really engaged, highly retained users, um, which obviously has a ton of value for us, but it has a ton of value for the entire industry. Mm -hmm. It is really interesting when you think about the level of retention that some games and maybe some studios have deemed acceptable. But you see companies, you mentioned Roblox, um, Supercell, others yep. that they, they, they produce a small number of you might call them AAA games in the mobile sense, yeah. right? And people stay playing in there for years, uh, potentially decades, yep. right? Uh, in fact, even Rovio, you, you think, okay, that's not yep. the same kind of game as like a Clash of Clans or something like that. But there are people playing Angry Birds, and I forget the number, but it was some insane number that they had retained for literally a decade. Yeah, yeah, still playing yep. that game. Yeah, I'm was, I'm in that group, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of those guys too. Yeah. Uh, 
um, <laughs> that's not my game necessarily, but I, I'm one of those that, you know what, I just kind of need one game, you know, and I play that for like three years, four yeah. years, five years, <laughs> you know, and, and, and then maybe I'll switch off. I don't know. Right. And so, so, but that's probably where we're looking in this yeah. ATT yeah. world, yeah. in this private sandbox world, where studios are thinking, I'm not going to go this hyper casual route and yeah. build a game in 30 days and release it and forget about it in 180 days, right? Yeah. I'm going to build bigger, better experiences, but there's yeah. higher risk there too, right? Yeah. But John, you know, it's crazy. I, I was in the music business a long time ago and, and you know, one of, one of my, like when I was a teenager, like one of my mentors- What business said, were you not in? <laughs> <laughs> one, one, one of my mentors once said, nobody sets out to not create a platinum record. Nobody sets out to not create a blockbuster movie. Nobody- Have you heard the out. song Friday by Rebecca something or other? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, no, no, nobody sets out to create a mediocre game that's not gonna be like a triple A game. Like a triple A game is a, is a result. It's not a strategy, yeah. right? And, you know, like it's lightning in a bottle, right? Like there's only so, like, there's only so many of these games that generate, you know, 500 million to a billion dollars in, in, in app spend in, in a year. And, and I, I keep focusing on the in-app spend. I mean, there's a ton mm. of, you know, in, you know, advertising revenue based games that are also doing incredibly well. Um, you know, companies like triple dot come to mind, which are just like, you know, crushing it. Um, but nobody sets out to do anything mediocre, right? Like these are outcomes. These aren't, these aren't goals, you know? And, and uh, if, if it was that easy to create a game that had high retention and high ARPU, then everybody <laughs> would do it, right? Like, yes. seriously. And, and millions of games would have tens of millions of users. Exactly. You'd have to invent Ex fake humans to play all these games. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like, I, you know, it's funny. It's, it really, you know, is like, it's so hard. I mean, I, you know, I've been, immersed in this business now for for about a year and that's the one thing that keeps coming back is the companies that are like truly crushing it right like the moon actives and platicas of the world you know there, there's a lot of rigor that goes into you know predictably being successful and it's hard mm -hmm. and it, it takes running a real business and it's not you know it's it's it, it's it's the game it's the game mechanics it's the it's the level of data and analytics and ai and economy design and 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 you know all of these things but it's it's product market fit like if you don't have product market fit you know you could spend 400 million dollars on user acquisition you can't force somebody to like something that's not awesome right and so mm -hmm. um you know, it's it's interesting when you when you look at the trends of like what you know what has staying power, you know where the retention is, and you know again it's few and far between, right? But I mean, there's a there's a lot of them to be to be clear. I mean, most like the average person doesn't realize how many mobile games generate you know nine to ten figures of, of revenue. It's it's kind of wild actually. We're all very fortunate to be in this industry. One thing I do like, in spite of the rigor, in spite of the measurement, in spite of the data is that at rock bottom, at some level, boots on the ground, you said the words lightning in a bottle. Mm -hmm. And and there's 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 some level of magic that makes yeah. a game great, that makes a song great, that makes a movie yep. great, that yep. makes something just work and fit the zeitgeist, fit yep. the you know the cultural milieu of what is great today and what's interesting today and what gets yep. viral and all that stuff. And I'm glad there's that element. I don't know if it's chance. I don't know if it's fate. I don't know if it's <laughs> whatever it is. I'm glad there's that element to just keep stirring the pot. Yeah. And hopefully great, amazing things happen. Absolutely. Look, no no entrepreneur who's been truly successful would would uh, skate the fact that there's a little bit of luck that's attached to some of this stuff or serendipity or whatever you want to call it. You know, the, the interesting thing, John, I, I think a lot about, you know, um, applications of AI and, you know, I've spent, you know, a good decade of my life in and around AI in different capacities. You'd think that sometime soon there'll be some, uh, and by the way, I have to imagine a lot of people are working on something similar. You know, there, <laughs> there, there's some AI models that can look at every little facet, to your point, mm -hmm. a game, a movie, a song, to dissect what are the attributes that actually make a hit a hit? What are the attributes that make a blockbuster movie a blockbuster movie or a triple A game Had a triple A game? This. Had a uh, exa that. Ex ex exactly, exactly, <laughs> right? And and uh, you know it's interesting because there, there are a, a lot of AI tools that are used in advertising and marketing that will literally look at a thirty second ad that's run on TV, for example, and it will break down everything from 
you know, the, the facial cues of the mm -hmm. actors and, and the tonality of the, uh, like light in the background of the person. Like they look at every single little feature to say, these are the attributes that have influenced the person who saw this advertisement. Um, and we're, we're, we're going to get to a really interesting place where there are some tools that allow, you know, intrepid marketers who really want to dissect what is it that makes something great, great. Um, well, we're going to have those tools at our fingertips. And frankly, the, the one thing I love, love about this industry, it is the most sophisticated, most data driven, most exciting uh, industry as it relates to the way data AI analytics are used to drive business outcomes, coupled with all this amazing creativity and magic. And, you know, that that's it's special. It's very special. It is. And we're, we are we have so many tools right now. We're going to have more tools and we're still going to have this random TikTok influencer with yeah. 10,000 followers who create something and boom, it goes nuts. And this yep. one game just takes off and it's yep. a billion dollar franchise in three years. Yes. This has been a lot of fun, Jason. Uh, thank you for taking the time to chat about the future of user acquisition and missed play and the industry itself. And uh, wish you the very best of luck in 2023. Thanks so much, John. Thanks for having me on.